So I have to tell you, you know that that's not usually the opening night film for Ebert Fest. Roger gave Star 80 four stars. He said about Bob Fosse, he dresses all in black and makes films about demonic undercurrents in our lives. Look at his credits, Cabaret, Lenny, all that jazz, and now Star 80. Although his Broadway musicals have been upbeat entertainments, he seems to see the movie camera as a device for peering into our shames and our secrets. Star 80 is his most despairing film. After the Nazi decadence of Cabaret, after the drug abuse and self-destruction in Lenny, and the depth death-obsessed hero of all that jazz, here is a movie that begins with violent death and burrows deeper. There were times when I could hardly keep my eyes on the screen and a moment near the end when I seriously asked myself if I wanted to stay in the theater. And yet, I think this is an important film, devastating, violent, hopeless, and important because it holds a mirror up to a part of the world we live in and helps us see it more clearly. In particular, it examines the connection between fame and obscurity, between those who have a moment of praise and notoriety and those who see themselves condemned to stand always at the edge of the spotlight. We're gonna have a conversation with the star of the film, Eric Roberts. And I actually, we just got, um, Mariel Hemingway was going to appear in person, then she was going to appear by satellite, but sadly, just a little bit ago, after the film, just before the film started, we got the notice that she can't be with us tonight. But please help me welcome back to the stage, Eric Roberts. Eric, we have a tradition at Ebert Fest. We give our filmmakers a golden thumb. It was a thumb that was cast by Roger years ago, and Nate Cohen would like to present you with our golden thumb. I, I am very moved because I've been nominated for everything. I've never won anything. <laughs> Well, you've won a golden thumb tonight. Thank you so much. And we're going to have you sit at the stage. We're going to take the thumb for you. We'll take care of it. Well, while we call onto the stage, Dana Stevens, the film critic extraordinaire at Slate Magazine and professor. You're going to see right. We're going to see you right next to Eric Roberts, and another guest who comes every year, Brian Tellerico, the managing editor at RogerEbert.com. Oh, and I guess this chair is for me. Thank you. Yes, Eric. <laughs> uh, a few times today, a couple hours ago when we started talking or met for the first time, you mentioned, you keep talking about Bob. You always give Bob credit for this movie. You did it backstage, you did it here. Talk a little bit about Bob and what he meant to you and what he meant to you during this movie. Well, first of all, I didn't call him Bob. <laughs> I called him Fosse. Um, Bob Fosse, and who's the director who did Being There? Uh, Hal Ashby. Hal Ashby. Um, I can't remember his name. Uh, Hal Ashby and Bob Fosse were always my favorite directors. And I was determined to work for both of them. 
And when I heard they were making Star 80, or they were casting Star 80, um, um, I read the article and I thought, wow, I don't want to play this part, <laughs> but I want to work for Bob Fosse. So I really did a lot of pre-homework homework and I went in to go meet him. And he, and, uh, he was very gracious, he was very nice, and we talked about women. <laughs> That's what he talked about, it was weird. He wanted, I guess, to find out my sexuality and what have you, I don't know. But he talked a lot about women and a lot about strip clubs and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and this guy Paul Snyder and blah, blah, blah. And we just talked for like an hour back and forth. And then he said, well, I'm gonna have you come back, I'm gonna have you read for me. So, and I did that five times. And then on the last reading, we read the whole screenplay through for the last time and he closed, he goes, hey kid, wanna make a movie? <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, sure. And, uh, but it, it, it was not fun. Like, it's not fun watching it. You're in it and you go, wow, but you don't have fun. Well, it's the same thing with making it. I was in it and I was wowing, but I was not having fun. But he, he gave me the most personal direction I ever got, and I will always hold it dear to my heart. I was doing that scene with the guitar, and I messed up the song, and I said, cut. You don't say cut on a Fosse set unless you're Fosse. <laughs> and he said, ha, ah, what's wrong with you? I said, I messed up. You're like, God damn it, come here. And he walks across this huge sound stage in Zoetrope. It's a about as big as half a football field. And he walks across, come here, come here, God damn it, come here. And he's all mad. And he's a little bitty, hyper skinny guy. Come here. So I go up to him and he says, look at me. I said, I'm looking at you, look at me. And I look at him and he goes, you're playing me if I weren't successful. Do you understand? <laughs> and I did. Because he and I had spent you know, three months in together, you know, you know, before we ever shot a frame of the movie. So I knew him very well. And uh, he, was, he was insane in the most glorious, productive way possible. And uh, I just fell in love with him as a man. He was just incredible. And, uh, and uh, he cared. He cared so much about his characters and his actors. He loved actors, which most most, uh, most uh, directors don't, by the way. But he did. And uh, what else do you want to know? You know, Eric, this movie changed your life, didn't it? Tell us, what, what did this movie do for you? What did it mean for you at the time? And how, what trajectory, how, what did it set you up? up for? Well, uh, well, I can tell you a couple of serious things, a couple of funny things. The, uh, the funniest thing is after this movie came out, I'd be walking down 7th Avenue in New York, you know, which is, you know, you know, you know, you know kind of my turf in 7th in the 50s. And I'd be walking down 7th Avenue and I would see a woman recognize me about a block or two away. I'd see them recognize me and go, ooh, cross the street. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was bad for about three years. And uh, for, for about a thousand days, you know, women were scared of me. And they let me know, no, not you, bye. And uh, yeah, it was, it was funny that way. But, but the, uh, the, uh, the kind of life changing was uh, to make that kind of character, because when you hear what he did, of course, he's unforgivable. But when you understand him, which I came to, when you understand him, he was just a baby, and he just got scared. Now, that doesn't forgive him but it explains him. And, um, and uh, had he lived, by the way, which is so sad, he'd have been a multimillionaire because he invented Chippendales. <laughs> he'd had all the things he wanted, all the girls, all the stuff, all the attention, all the money, all the stuff. He'd had it all. But he made a mistake because he got scared. And, uh, you know, you can't forgive him. What did he do? And my, uh, my wife always makes fun of me because I tell her, you have to like who you play. And she goes, yeah, right. <laughs> anyway. But I did, I did get an affection for him, even though he was such an asshole. <laughs> Any, what else? 
Okay, my question, I have so many for you after seeing this again, and I had not seen it since it came out. Wow. <laughs> so, but I saw it many times back then. I think you, I saw it a few you're times. You're so much older than you look. <laughs> <laughs> I was in high school when it came out, but I admired it a lot. And as I was saying to some other critics here today, I was sort of scared to see it again. Like, what if it doesn't hold up? Or what if now it seems sort of exploitive or abusive in a way that I didn't see then? And as you said before the film, you know, that was sort of the pre-Me Too era when things read differently. But boy, does it hold up. That right. movie is amazing. Um, so I guess my, my first question would be about how you created the relationship with Mariel that you have on screen. I know that Fosse had an unusual rehearsal period where he had the two of you together you know, rehearsing for six weeks before yeah. the sh movie shot, which is quite unusual, right? And, uh, and I'm just wondering what he did to help establish and what you two did to help establish that intimacy and that real sense of relationship that the two of you have. I mean, it's, there's just, um, there's so much that, that happens between you. Okay, that's, uh, I'm not a very generous actor after the fact. I don't give you know, people credit you know, to be nice, but Mariel Hemingway never got her due. This, the, the, the innocence and the kindness in which she played this character is monumental. And it, and it gives a great, a great dichotomy to my, to my con man because she was so delicate and so likable and so, such a girl. She wasn't a woman, she was a girl. And she was so delicate. And yet, she's a big old girl, you know, she's like six feet tall. But, 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 but she came across as just this wonderful, delicate, beautiful thing, and that's acting. She's a wonderful actor, and she doesn't get the credit she deserves, because I had such a, such, a, such a flashy part and so dynamic, I get all the credit in this movie. I don't deserve it. Uh, I mean, I deserve some of it. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, she, she was monumentally good, and I don't think she gets the credit. So is Carol Baker. That portrayal was so delicate because she could c come across just as a mother who's a bitch, you know, or a mother who cares but is a bitch because she cares, you know, all the, all the cliches. But she came across as a tragic, tragic figure of not being able to ever reach anybody who she was dealing with. And it just, I just love her performance like I love my wife. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I'm curious, I'm oh, sorry. Um, you talk about getting under the skin of a character like this and understanding a character like this. Is it harder to shake when you play a character like this? Like, how do you go home at night when you're playing this role? How do you leave it behind? Or is that just part of the job? Everybody makes it sound like it's really heavy, it's really deep, and it kind of is at first. But it's like clothes. You take them off at night, and you're out of them. And sometimes you gotta wash them. Sometimes you gotta wear them dirty, whatever it is, but it's just like clothes. You have them on, you have them off. And if you don't do that, you can lose your mind. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and, and especially when you play people who are real people, you have real boundaries. You can't make shit up, excuse me. You can't, you can't, you can't make stuff up. You have, to, you have, you have, you have, you have boundaries. And uh, so you can't jam, you know, you can't just do something. You have to, you, you have, you know, you, you have boundaries that you have to stay inside of. And it's, and it's hard. And it's, and, um, and you want to be honest, you know? And uh, it, it teaches you a lot about yourself and that you have to leave yourself. And uh, it's hard and it's fun. You know, one of the things about this, you're right, Muriel, and I hope that she's listening wherever she is or that she'll see this later, her acting was so good as a counterpoint against your intensity, her, her sweetness and, and her, her innocence. And she is, she's tall and she's bigger, but she was so, the fragility of her was, it came across so well in this film. How do you, how do you prepare? I know it's acting, but how do you prepare to play a character so intense? What do, what, I, I don't know if you can even, I, it's been 40 years ago, but you've been in so many movies, and I know in, in some you're funny, and some you're intense, and some in this one though, in particular, because I remember Roger talking about your intensity in this film. 
What do you do to prepare for that? Well, I have to be careful here because it can, it can, it can get misunderstood, but it's just an analogy, okay? Help me, don't get mad at me. It's like talking about sex. We all know the mechanics, but when you live through it with a lover who, who you are in love with, it becomes something monumental. It becomes much more than physical delight. It becomes precious. It becomes special. It becomes the only. And uh, that's the same thing when you prepare parts. You know the mechanics, but when you get in it and you've decided I'm gonna wear this like my skin and you you really get unhappy a lot because you feel so bad for what's gone before you without you. And had you been there, it would have been different, maybe. You know, you start going through all that, all that mental baggage that you have to when you take on another personality. And especially somebody who's like Paul Snyder, which I am not. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> and I am so not like Paul, I mean. And, uh, but, but, but I had Bob Fosse, and it was a miracle. And when he said that to me about playing himself, you know, playing me, if I weren't successful, do you understand? <sighs> yes. And then as we walked back to set, I thought I'm gonna even walk like you. Yeah. And I, 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 everything I did was him because, um, because he was making this movie because he understood this man that tragedy and uh, apparently he understood it all the way down to his bone what else the other thing I want to ask and I'm gonna let, give it to um, Brian and Dana I actually we were Roger and I were friends with Hugh Hefner and um, I am friends with his daughter Christy Hefner as well I've been to the Playboy Mansion many times and um, were those scenes, any of those scenes shot, was that a set or were any of those shot at the Playboy? Everything you saw in this movie was shot where it really happened. All the stuff at the mansion was shot at the mansion. All the stuff where, where the, uh, the murder-suicide happened was, was where the murder-suicide happened. Everything, the, uh, the car lot where he bought the car was the car lot where he bought the car. Everything, that's, that's Bob, Bob Fosse was obsessed with this had to be a perfect docudrama. Yeah, and he did, didn't he? I loved him so much as an actor, because you, know, you can make up a question and you have a legitimate answer. He was so good. I was reading just today in, in Sam Wasson's biography of Fosse, a chapter about this movie, that in Hefner's office, there were some letters on his desk and Fosse had them be letters that Dorothy had written to her mother that were sitting there, I guess, waiting to be mailed or something. <laughs> so he was so obsessive to the level. I don't know if he wrote them or what was in the letters, but you know, he was imagining what each prop on the desk would have been. He was complete. Yeah. Uh, my question to you is uh, <laughs> maybe not in, in, in fitting with the somberness of this movie, but you also play this character for this dark, dark humor. You know, there were some, some laughs in the audience at some moments with, with Paul Snyder because he's so oblivious to how he appears, right? Especially in the scenes at the Playboy Mansion or scenes where he's, you know, out shopping for his new outfits. And, um, and I'm wondering if you have any memory of that, of, you know, how it was to try to find this dark comedy in this terrible story. Well, uh, I didn't have any trouble with the transition because I'm a country bumpkin. And, and, and yet I became a movie star, and I had to learn how to talk and walk and act like a grown-up. And uh, uh, so I, un I understood with that what, what, what he was going through there. He was going through a change, and he was going to be different, and he was going to be better. And uh, adolescents all go through that. <laughs> but he was a grown-up. He was just immature and lost. Um. We spoke earlier about how Roger's advocacy for your career at this point, Star 80, Runaway Train, he was just such a fan of yours. And it's one of the things that got me into him, believe it or not. I remember them talking about Runaway Train on the show, so there's a nice connection here. Can you speak about that? And there's an interview on the site where I think he spoke with you like the day you got your Oscar nomination or the day after, because you're talking about just getting the call and getting your Oscar nomination for Runaway Train. So can you speak about Roger's advocacy and what it meant, or critical advocacy in general? 
Well, you know, when you, when you have an advocate who is famous, it makes you feel special. He thinks I'm cool. You know, <laughs> it's nice. And uh, Siskel and Ebert were, 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 my, were my favorite uh, reviewers. And, uh, and um, I always, I always, and I always agreed with them. And uh, so that's why they're my favorite. And, uh, but, uh, what, but what, what was it important to have that kind of support from the industry, from the critical industry when you were coming well, up? Well, here's young? the thing about support from the industry. In my first movie, King of the Gypsies, I'm getting these rave reviews. I'm the next Marlon Brando. I'm James Dean and I are brothers, blah, 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 all this ridiculous complimentary bullshit. And then finally I get to one that says, he's a bad imitation of Richard Gere. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I got mad. But then I turned to my manager and I said, bah, 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 bah. and he goes, look, if you're gonna believe that, you gotta believe that. And if you're gonna believe that, you gotta believe that. I suggest you don't read them. <laughs> so from that day to this, I have never read a review. I asked my wife, say, hey, are they good? <laughs> but, but no, I don't read them because I'm not a bad imitation of Richard Gere. <laughs> He's a truly great actor. I'm very different. <laughs> and and I, uh, I work with Gere. He's so cool. So, so anyway, what else? Well, Richard Gere said he thinks he's a... Uh, no, I, no, he didn't. No, I'm, I'm not going to even say that. <laughs> 730-something movies you've worked with almost everybody. Why are, are you working so regularly and so consistently? I saw you call it luck once. You're lucky to be working. Explain it's that. explainable, guys. Here's what it is. I made, like every other actor, one to four movies a year. On a great year, four movies. Oh, my God, I'm so busy. I can't even breathe. One, one, one movie a year is about all you should really make. Okay. Then they take film, and we get digital. So everybody who has a camera is basically a studio and they can release their own movies, blah, blah, blah. So my wife, kind of, this is about 1994, five, six, and seven is the transitional years. And my wife comes to me, she goes, honey, sit down. What's up? She goes, we're getting 30 to 50 offers every day from all over the world. And some of them are real. <laughs> Do you want to go do this? Yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, let's, let's go see the world for free. Come on, let's go. So we did for about three years. We just worked every, I was on a set literally every single day somewhere, having the time of my life. And, uh, and uh, what's the question? <laughs> I think you answered it. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, was just, it was just fun. And they just kept offering. And we still get 30 to 50 offers every day from all over the world. And it makes me so embarrassed and so happy and so proud. <laughs> and I understand that you are actually maybe even preparing for con doing more movies now after, uh, like very soon. Anything that you can tell us about? You're told not to talk about it because everybody steals ideas, you know? Yeah. Uh, what can I tell you about that? Well, I can tell you, I had my favorite job I ever had about a year and a half ago. I did a season of Righteous Gemstones. Ooh. Does anybody know that show? <laughs> the best comedy since All in the Family first aired, isn't it? Oh my God, what a show. That was my favorite job I've ever had in, the, in all those jobs. That was my favorite one. Righteous Gemstones. If you don't know it, you got to find it. It'll make you happy. HBO. I want to go back to the beginning. What made you want to be an actor? <laughs> Is that okay to ask? Oh, yeah, sure. I had a terrible stutter as a kid. I couldn't talk to anybody. Blah, 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 blah. I always stutter and everybody laughed at me at school. But then I found out if I memorized stuff, I could speak. So I became an actor kind of for that reason. And then I started to understand I could get good. I, I couldn't just talk, I could talk as other people. And I started to love them. And the first part that I felt I ever really had to understand to become the part was, was uh, John Henry and Member of the Wedding. I was eight and I was doing it with all these grown-ups. 
and, and, uh, and, and uh, John Henry dies. But he's got this, he's got this moment where, where he, uh, he calls Frankie, 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 Frankie. Only I imitated my baby sister who would always call me Eric. So I said, Frankie. And that was kind of, I'm only eight years old, but that was my first step in taking my life and overlapping it into acting. It sounds very uh, unimportant. But it was, it was a moment in my life that I understood that you know, life and art overlap completely. And you can do that. Like the audience? Should we go to the audience? Anyone in the audience have a yes, question? Yes, we have. Well, we have. Um, there's a someone with a mic. The mic. The microphones and. Raise so your hand, forth. and someone with a mic will find you. There's a hand. And while Don't leave. I haven't gotten to the good part yet. <laughs> <laughs> while while the. I, I have a question on your right. Hi. Um, what I want to say... Is, Eric, are you standing? This, I, it's me, Michael. It's Got Michael. Me, Michael. Oh, Listen, oh, okay. What I, what Michael I Barker. Say Celebrity is, cameo. ...is what I think blows my mind about Eric Roberts. I, the only other actor I can think of like this in my experience was Vanessa Redgrave. He takes these incredible risks. He risks falling on his face. He does all these extreme characters. And it, it, it's, it's just an amazing thing. And that he's here with us today and so exuberant and happy after playing all these extreme characters, it's really amazing. And I think he's the epitome of great actors because he's not afraid to take those risks. Thank you. That is so nice. Thank you. Ask me a question or two. What do you want to know? Uh, I think someone there. Microphone. I'm not on. Question from the balcony in the Bal center. Yes, the balcony, please. Hi, just want to know where you come from and how where you come from affects how you act. Well, uh, my first uh, half a dozen years were spent in New Orleans. My next half a dozen years were spent in Atlanta. And then 22 years in New York. And uh, then another 20 years in New York and LA back and forth. And that's me. And uh, I love Southern cooking, even though it'll kill you. And, uh, and uh, I, am, I am indeed, even though I have, have, uh, have, have, uh, have lost my first accent, uh, I am a Southerner, and I love the South. All right, we got a question in the center. Hi, thanks. I am not quite sure how to ask this question, but I realized that I this is... Oh, hi. Okay. I realized that this was the first film I saw you in, and for a long time I had a, I had a tough time watching movies that you were in because I disliked you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, and I, and I wondered if at any point, and you know, you've done a, you know, really diverse roles, you know, in your career, but was this ever a typecasting issue for all, or at all for you, or did everybody see you as, you know, with broad talents? No, nobody saw me as an actor. They saw me as that guy. Oh. And for 10 years, I was offered that guy. And I'd have to really stick it out to get other offers. It was hard for a while, because I was just that guy. And I'm not that guy. <laughs> that was a good question. I have one to your right panel. It got in the way. It really did. Yeah. Yes. This is not a question. This is just a comment. I, I have not seen this movie before. I have not heard about the underlying events. But I predicted the deaths early in the movie. And when the deaths actually happened, I wept. And I can't explain it. Wow, that's so cool. You God bless Bob Fosse. From the balcony in the center. Hi, you were mentioning uh, Bob Fosse being a genius, and obviously he is, and a legend. Uh, you worked with another 
genius and legend in Sven Nykvist in this film. And I was wondering if you had anything to, to say about him. And I could talk all day about Sven. He and I were very close. We worked together three times. My first movie, my best movie, and the Swedish piece of junk. But, 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 but he was one of the coolest guys in the world. He was very mild-mannered. He was very handsome. He had, he had like you know, white hair and a white beard. He was tall. He was cool. He had his Swedish accent, he sounded very sexy, you know, very cool guy. And, uh, and yet, and yet he, was, he was an artist down to his bone marrow. And uh, he would ask Fossey, that's the mood. And Fossey would say, well, it's bleak today, one this and this and this. Oh, you want a little darkness, okay, okay. <laughs> he was so, he's a wonderful guy. And uh, he loved actors too. Uh, he, uh, yeah. He was a neat person. I was, I was very sad when he lost him. We got one in the house to your left. To the left, okay. And over there. Hi. Hi. One of my favorite movies is Raggedy Man. Oh. Could you, I know it's not Star 80, but could you tell us a little bit about it? I just loved you in that. Well, it had been, uh, I, made, I, made, I made King of the Gypsies. And then I did a thing called Paul's Case for the American Short Story series, and th then I did Raggedy Man. And Raggedy Man, I played, I, I played a boy that I grew up with. He talked like this. His name is Irwin White. He talked like this, and he's a really sweet boy. And so I grew up with him in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, so when I, so when I, so so when I read this part, I thought, Oh, this is Irwin. Oh, I got to play this part because I know this 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 boy. So I went. And audition, and uh, Jack Fisk, who was Sissy Spacek's husband, he gave me the part, and um, then we, then I, then I played a good guy. He was a good guy, and uh, but it didn't, it didn't, it didn't change everybody's image of me. <laughs> they, they, they still thought it was that guy. Here, I have a question straight in front of the panel, please. Where, where are you? Oh, hello. Right in the center here. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for being here. I um, recently read the biography of Bob Fosse, which has some really detailed background on the making of this movie. Um, and I also read in that book, I know you don't try to not to read reviews, but in that book, I saw that a lot of reviews of this movie pointed out how misogynistic of reviews called this movie misogynistic. So going into seeing this movie, I was expecting that I prepared myself for that, but I know that Siskel and Ebert, you know, they were one of the few critics that really did levy buoy this movie. So I'm curious, in the critical reception, did you have conversations with Bob Fosse, Muriel Hemingway, right after the movie came out about how you thought it would be perceived versus how the misogynistic undertones maybe came across? And maybe my own commentary, like the playing the guitar to a woman, that's a thing that women have experienced. It was in the Barbie movie. So I'm curious if you're, if you like recognize those misogynistic tones or if you had conversations about Bob Fosse and how he interpreted the feminist angle of it versus now. Well, like I told you, after my first movie, when I'm a bad imitation of Richard Gere, <laughs> I never read any more reviews. I don't read them. I won't look at them at all. I'll ask my wife, uh, do they like me? And, uh, but that's it. And because uh, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But almost, n almost nobody who's a little boy wants to grow up to like, to like be an agent. They become an agent by default. Almost nobody wants to grow up to become a critic. They become a critic by default. <laughs> so, um, these, so, excuse Dana me. Dana or Brian, do you have anything <laughs> to say about that? In, I've gotten myself in such a hole, haven't I? God, I'm so sorry. Uh, but that's usually the case. Not always. Not always, apparently. But it, 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 it's, it's not a job an eight-year-old wants to grow up to do. That's all. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Please help me. I <laughs> About the critical response to this movie, I was reading that same chapter of that same book today. It's a great book, that bio of Bob Fosse, um, yeah. right? Yeah. And you, you talked to him for it, right? Did you yeah. talk to Sam Watson, sure, the author? Um, Sam was a great man, too. Oh, my God. Yeah, I don't know. But I just wanted to note about the critical reception for this movie is that it's one of those movies that it took a long time for people to discover, right? I mean, yeah. Siskel and Ebert both liked it. 
Pauline Kael and Andrew Saris both hated it, rare agreement between them. In general, it was sort of dismissed. It was the last movie Fosse ever made, I think maybe because, you know, he, he, was, he felt bitter about its reception. And now, almost well, 40 died. years. He died. He, had, he lived four more years after the movie came out, but. Yeah, it was, anyway, it was his last one. And now I feel like it's, it's taken all these 40 years to come to the place where people can see the movie that he actually made, which I think you're right. Is a beautiful film. Anybody else? Uh, we have a question in the house to your left. Okay. Okay. Hi, I'm never gonna get this chance again, so I have to tell you how I first heard your name. It was in a trailer for a super cheap movie about a killer cyclops in ancient Rome, and I and, made that movie. Yes, and it said, "and Academy Award nominee Eric Roberts." And I was like, oh man, that's all they have, isn't it? Just <laughs> to, to sell this. It was called did Cyclops. Have, it was a fun movie to make. So, do you have any, so can you tell me some things about this movie and making it? About, about Cyclops? I made, I made two movies for the same reason. One was Cyclops and one was, what's the other one? Uh, it'll come to me, I forget. But it's because I got to work with, um, I got to do that uh, where I'm being like attacked by a monster, but there's nothing there. I'm just <laughs> and then they put the monster in after. So he's doing all these crazy things, but he, he was never there. What's that called? Green screen. Green screen, thank you very much. And so those, those are two movies were green screen, and that's why I made those two movies. That's why I made that movie, because I'd never done, okay, I gotta do that. So I went and did it, yeah. Some, sometimes you, uh, you make movies for fun. So there's someone here with a, a hand, I have keep, a keeps coming up and no microphone. Can you, yeah, right here, third row, can you give her a microphone, please? Thank you. I, um, Hi. having had spent so much time with Bob Fosse, what do you think motivated him to make this movie? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. He, he was that guy, let's just do this thing. He was, he was a little nutty, he was a little driven, he was a little mad. He was a little perfect. He was, he was a lot of things, and he was just driven. And I think, I think it was, you know, sex, fame, and failure. I think those things are all in the ingredients we all want to watch because they're, they're fun to watch. You're asking me an intelligent question? I'm an actor. You know, something else interesting about this film for me is I also knew Peter Bogdanovich, who... Oh, uh, I got a story for you guys. Yes, tell us, uh, tell us the Peter, your Peter Bogdanovich. I can story. only tell this now. I've held, I've held this story to heart for 40 years. Has it been 40 years? Wow, that's, I'm old. I had no idea. It snuck on me. I didn't see it coming. Anyway, uh, we're staying at the Comstock Hotel. We're doing a pre-production. And uh, we're not going to shoot for probably six more weeks. We're, in the, we're the Comstock, which is no longer the Comstock. It's called something else now. But uh, it's, near, it's near Westwood or it's in Westwood. Anyway, we're at that hotel. Uh, Bob Fosse did methamphetamine, so he's always raring to go. And he's not coming to the door one morning early. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay, well, I'm not dressed. Have a seat. I'm, I'm, I'm in the bathroom, blah, blah, go in the bathroom. I hear my phone ring. Answer my phone. He says, I'm not going to answer your phone. So I come out. I answer Hello, it's, Bogdan it's Bogdanovich. And he tells me all about this, this movie he's gonna make about, about Dorothy Stratton. And he asked me how much I was being paid. I said, well, I can't tell you that. He goes, well, whatever you're making, I will pay you better and all this kind of stuff and I will consider you for this part of the movie. You know, blah, blah, blah. How do you like Mr. Fosse? And, 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 uh, and Bob Fosse's right there. <laughs> <laughs> We, uh, we talk about Fosse, and we talk about, about Dorothy, and now poor Fosse, <laughs> he can't make this movie. It's going to be, it's going to destroy him. But then I'm going to make the movie about it, and it's going to blah, 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 hear all this stuff. And we're laughing, hang on, the phone, we're laughing, having so much fun, but it was tragic. It was tragic to me. This man loved her to death, to the point where he replaced her with her sister. Oh, it's so weird. So, but, uh, so for the, those in the audience 
who don't know, he was really in love with Dorothy Stratton after she was murdered. He ended up, the little girl in the movie who plays her, her sister, sister grew up to be Louise Stratton, who Peter Bogdanovich then married her sister when she grew up. Oh, rumble, rumble. <laughs> yeah, me too. I have a question in the center, please. Center. Hi. Hi. Um, can you stand so we can see you, please? Yes, ma'am, I'm right here. She oh, is standing. She is standing. I'm <laughs> so mean. I'm so sorry. No, I'm not tall either. No, no worries, no worries. Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight for this wonderful You're program. so welcome. It's so much fun to be here. Uh, it's just the best. Um, so sobriety was an important part of Roger's life. And I know, or I read anyway, that that's also an important part of your life as well. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, like how becoming sober might have or, or didn't, you know, well, change your yourself as a as a actor, you know? I feel this is not the time or the place for that, but I will tell you this. Bob Fosse did methamphetamine every day he worked. And one day he and I, we're doing some research somewhere. I forget where, oh, we're in Vancouver. And we're, we're, we're uh, two months away from starting to shoot. And I, say, and I see him pop a tiny little white pill, pop. I said, what was that? He swallowed it. I said, uh, can I have one? He said, sure. He goes, pop it. I was away for two days. I've never done methamphetamine again. <laughs> and I, <laughs> this is how he lived every day. And uh, what, what, was, what, was, what, was the, what was the point of this? What was it? Sobriety. sobriety. Oh, sobriety. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, that. So, uh, yeah, I, I've done every drug there is to try. I've tried everything. Some stuff I've gone overboard with. But um, sobriety is the only way to live your life because you can't get anything done when you're high. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it will eat your brain. Uh, if I hadn't met my wife, I would not be standing, let alone standing here. So I got saved by somebody. But we can't always bank on that. I got lucky. But you have to do it yourself, and it's hard. And you have to care about yourself. That's harder. And you know what? We care about you, and we thank you so oh, much for coming you, tonight.